Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts and minds be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Oh my, what a challenge our scripture gives us this week. It says, you lack one thing, go, sell what you own, give your money to the poor, then come, follow me. What is Jesus asking the wealthy man to do? What is Jesus asking us to do? Jesus says that if the man wants to enter into the kingdom of God, he must sell or give everything away. Really? Jesus believes the man needs to sell all of his earthly possessions? It's my natural instinct to, wa instinct to want to tone down what Jesus is asking of the man, to make it a little less demanding, a little more comfortable. Will Williman, a renowned theologian, said, of course, if I had been Jesus that day, that's not what I would have said. I might have asked the well-heeled young man for an endowment fund for student scholarships, <laughs> a bigger pledge for the church budget, not everything. Now, there are a few important details to get straight here. This man is a good guy. He's asking Jesus how to be, how to be faithful. I kind of want to defend him. It feels like Jesus' response is harsh. Does the well-intentioned man really deserve that? There's got to be some middle way here. Part of me wants to protect him, but then I realize I also want to protect myself. Because if Jesus asks a devout man to give up everything, what do I have to give up? The conversational exchange between them starts off well enough with sincerity and humility. The man approaches Jesus on his knees and calls him good teacher, acknowledging that he has some important things to learn. He asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then here Jesus throws the unexpected curve, curveball. Go, sell what you own and give your money to the poor. Then come follow me. I don't know about you, but I didn't see that one coming. And Jesus' challenge is not only difficult to hear, but also perplexing. Now, during this time and place in history, wealthy people were celebrated. Their contributions and gift to the community supported the temple's rituals and practice. It was assumed that God favored the wealthy. Many thought that material wealth meant spiritual virtue. Jesus' words would have been shocking to hear during those days. And not only did he ask for the man to give everything up, but he also turned the man's understanding of the world upside down. And Jesus doesn't end there. It's not the only thing, it's not the only scandalous thing that he says in this passage. When the disappointed man leaves, Jesus tells the disciples that it's hard for those with wealth to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now take a second to think about that. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. What an absurd idea. I think Frederick Buechner captures the ridiculousness well. Nelson Rockefeller attempting to, attempting to pass through the night deposit slot of the Chase Manhattan Bank to me would seem a reasonable modern equivalent. Jesus artfully utilizes the absurdity of his statement to emphasize his point that it's impossible to enter into the kingdom of God alone. Jesus' comments here are not easily heard, perhaps especially by us. In light of the challenge that Jesus provides, it's important to remember that Jesus loves this man. The intention of what the man said was not sinful. He didn't mean to offend. As a follower of Jewish law, the man really did sincerely want to know what he had to do. And Jesus is gutsy and loving to name this man's weakness. 
I love what Will Williman had to say about this. Jesus spoke an unpleasant word to the rich man because, him, because he loved him. And I fear that I, in the name of love, have made people's lives a little less miserable rather than a lot more redeemed. Jesus uses these sharp words out of love because he wants to help this man see things in a new way. He wants to help this man and us to see that what he thinks is good in life, in fact, might keep him separated from God. The man did not let go of his wealth because it made him feel secure and self-dependent. And self now, I want to clarify something here. What I see is holding this man back in this story is not the wealth itself, but the man's inability to let go of it. My father likes to tell the story of the man who bragged about being self-made until an exacerbated friend finally said, well, that relieves the Lord of a terrific responsibility. <laughs> For this man of this story, the thing separating him from God is his dependence upon his privilege for a feeling of self-worth. Now, my challenge to the congregation today is, how might we relate to this story? For some, we actually might intimately relate to the man. We might feel we're more admired than our neighbors because we have a flashy sports car or a large house. For others, we might relate in a less obvious way. We might be fixated on helping our kids be successful. We want our children to pursue every opportunity. But what we miss when we're so busy chasing every opportunity for the future is actually having time with our family. And some of us might actually not even have a choice. We have to rely on God because we've had everything taken away or not had anything in the first place. This passage really prompted me to dig deep to think about my own relationship with wealth and privilege. This is not a parallel, but here's one way that I relate to this story. I have been blessed in my life that I've been able to travel to far corners of the world, including um, Ecuador, South Africa, Bangladesh. And my intentions of traveling to these places is to provide assistance to those less fortunate than me. And these opportunities have been moments of great growth and learning for me. And in this passage, the rich man is a good person trying to do the right thing, a person of privilege wanting to help others. And I'm going to these places wanting to help people. And yet, ironically, I was only able to be there in the first place because I was privileged. Along with our dependence upon these things, can come the dangerous assumption that one doesn't need God or other people. We begin to think that we've earned what we've had without the help of others. We don't reflect upon the gifts that we've been given. But I want you to think for a moment. Can you honestly tell me of something that you've earned or received in your life that didn't involve the help of someone else? Wealth might feel like freedom, but it actually can end up limiting us because we are left with the illusion of self-sufficiency. And if we have the illusion of self-sufficiency, then we think that we don't need God or others. Jesus gives us the invitation to break away from this dependence upon things, but we have to be courageous to receive his extended hand. Paul Waldell astutely observes, the unsettling upshot from this gospel passage is that, yes, it may indeed be hard to enter the kingdom of God, but the source of difficulty comes not from Jesus, but from us. It's the wealthy man that chooses not to accept the kingdom of God, not Jesus who chooses for him not to. Now, the difficult question is unavoidable. Is Jesus instructing us to give everything away? I actually don't think so. He's asking us to let go of those earthly things that give us the illusion that we can make it on our own. Joining the kingdom of God is about transformation in character that can happen when we make room for God instead. Because for God, all things are possible. 
Taking this first step, any first step, can be difficult and feel risky, especially when we are wading into the unknown. But it's the commitment to take that second step, third step, fourth step, that can feel even more difficult and is even more important. We love to praise first steps. For instance, there's an old proverb, the longest journeys begin with a first step. And of course, that's true. But where are the proverbs and words of praise for second steps, third steps, and fourth steps? Those may be even more important. The focus, Jesus says, should not be on the wealth itself, but instead on the change in practice and character that happens within ourselves. It's committing a monthly pledge to the church, or regularly donating to the Yankee Fair, or annually providing offerings for neighbors in need. It's not a one-time deal. It's about making the commitment over and over again. It's about waking up every morning and dedicating your day to do God's work. This is really hard. But the good news is that Jesus does not expect us to make this commitment by ourselves. In fact, he actively discourages it. Our transformation is only possible with God or others who help us to recognize God's presence. The kingdom is reached in relationship because transformation is a process and based within an ongoing dialogue of commitment. In response to the man's question about eternal life, Jesus moves the focus outward. He does not directly address the man's question about his own salvation. Instead, Jesus redirects the conversation towards his gracious behavior towards others. The man asks a question about salvation, a spiritual matter, and he gets a response about possessions, an earthly matter. Rather, Jesus is trying to help the man to see that earthly matters are in fact spiritual matters and vice versa. The distance between the kingdom of God and us might in fact be closer than we think. The kingdom of God might be found among us in how our relationships challenge us to be our best version of ourselves. The passage concludes with the much lauded line, may those who are first be last, and the last be, fe the last be first. We are, all, we are all short of entering into the kingdom of God on our own. We need each other to discern God's presence and to transform into the people that we are called to be. This may be muddled theology, but Jesus, might just be telling us that it doesn't matter how we enter. We can enter into the kingdom of God in no particular order and all at once. Clearly, we're not expected to enter into the kingdom single file. In fact, we cannot. Amen.